It's strange, really. Humans are the most average and alien species could be. Their lean bipedal build is very common in the Galactic Confederation, and they're physically average in most aspects. Humans have moderate strength and speed, only outperforming in endurance and intelligence. Visibly speaking, they don't have horns, fangs, tails, antennae, claws, scales, hide, or fur. Ironically, their lack of such natural defenses is what makes them so unique. Humans look like teddy bears compared to other races, and they act like them too. Always asking how you are, how your family is, how your day is going. Most humans aren't intimidated by other Xenos treating them politely and trying to understand and learn their cultural norms. Humans always try and cheer sentience up or give helpful advice, acting very empathetically. But the truth is, humans are very, very creepy. It's because of their lack of expression. Humans aren't nearly as visually expressive as other species being limited to only their mouth and eyebrows. There's no tail wagging, antennae twitching, or claw clicking, just some facial muscles that move up and down to show approval or disapproval. Humans always look unfazed by terrible events and scenes, looking blankly at whatever happened with a few extra or fewer wrinkles on their face. Their voices aren't much better. Although humans have a wide vocal range, they prefer to speak the same way at all times, only raising their voice when angry and lowering it to be quiet. A flat, monotone voice complimenting you or giving you their dearest condolences. Yet another thing is their eyes. Human pupils don't dilate when they see something they like or change color depending on mood or emotion. They just stay the same. Only dilating in the dark or during adrenaline rushes, they remain cold and lifeless, observing everything quietly, judging all, knowing all. I experienced this firsthand when I was walking to a party with a human colleague, Alan. It was nothing much, just a monthly workplace party to raise morale. I was excitedly discussing our sales, my tail wagging. They were up 17%. Surely we'd get a promotion. Alan seemed to share my delight, although he didn't sound or look like it. We were almost there when suddenly two cars crashed into each other. I froze fur on end, claws unsheathed, not knowing what to do. Out of the corner of my eye, I could Alan rushing forward, calmly dragging two men out one of the mangled vehicles before pulling a man and woman out of the other. I finally snapped back to my senses, fumbling with my phone before I managed to call for medical services. By the time they arrived, it was too late. All four civilians involved in the accident had died, despite Alan's efforts to stop there, save them, and I was sobbing. I could feel Alan wrapping his arm around me, soothing me, telling me it was going to be all right. I looked up into his face, his weird, flat, snoutless face, and flinched. It was devoid of emotion. His eyebrows were slightly furrowed, but that was it. I cringed away from him, pushing him away, getting no reaction. H how are you s so calm? I choked out, and he tilted his head to one side. What do you mean? Alan said. I'm not, I'm just as worried as you are, he said. Was he lying to make me feel better? Here, take this. An Aureli paramedic rumbled, his voice heavy with sorrow. He wrapped a weighted blanket around the two of us, and a few moments later, a Nezoid police officer approached us, antennae vibrating. I'm sorry, but I have a few questions about the accident, she whispered her two large, dilated eyes switching between Alan and me. Alan answered for me. Sure, I can answer them. Could you please take my friend Rika home for me? I think she's in shock. Friend. The word echoed in my head and I wiped away tears. I could only watch as Alan looked back at me as the officer pulled him away, his empty brown eyes looking back at me. Sure, I considered Alan to be a colleague and a good one at that. But a friend? After what I saw... I wasn't even sure if I wanted to continue working with him. Come, let's take you home. I turned to see another Nezoid officer, her antennae drooping with sympathy. Tut, thank you, I stammered, following her wordlessly to her car. First time witnessing death? She asked rather bluntly, and I nodded. Yeah, it's always rough the first time. Your friend seemed all right, though. He a soldier or doctor? I smiled. No, a salesman, I whispered. I watched as her antennae went completely limp, a sign of confusion. Huh, that's weird. Wait, is he a human? She asked. Yes, he is. I watched as her antennae took a neutral position. Ah, uh, humans are like that. 
Don't show much emotion, but just as caring as the rest of us. By now she had reached my house, and I stammered words of thanks as I exited her car. No need, she replied. Just doing my duty. Have a good night. You too, I chirped as I entered my home. I collapsed in my bed, mentally exhausted. I had missed the party, but that was the last thing I was thinking about. I let my bots strip me of my work clothes and dress me in my pajamas. I hadn't done much research on humans, being told their culture was similar enough to ours, and working with Alan for a few months had proved that. So, what's your name? I asked, looking at the human who was sitting across the table from me. He had an almost bored expression on his face, leaning back in his chair. Alan, Alan Gardner. Alan responded, and I typed that down. Alan, did you witness the collision between the vehicles directly, or did you stumble onto the scene? I questioned, looking up at him. I witnessed it directly. He answered, and I made sure to keep my antennae in a neutral position. Well, it's a good thing you didn't get hurt. What did you do when you witnessed the crash? I prepared to type. I rushed over and tried to deliver basic first aid, but I was too late. Alan said simply, and I noticed dried blood all over his hands. Here. I stood up and grabbed a bottle of sanitation spray and tissues, passing him the items. Thanks. I watched as he casually cleaned his bloodied hands, throwing the tissues into a nearby trash can before sitting back down. Did you see how the crash occurred? Normally we'd use security footage for this kind of thing, but we haven't installed any cameras in this region yet, I admitted, only seconds later realizing that was a stupid thing to tell a random civilian. Oh, there's no cameras? Alan seemed interested in this knowledge, and I stiffened. Yes, there are none. I didn't want to lie, so I reluctantly told him the truth. Okay. He dismissed it, and I let out an internal shake of relief. Well, I didn't see fully, but if I remember correctly, it was a red light. The first car just ran it and hit the second car at full force. It could have been mechanical problems, he said. I quickly typed this information. Well, thank you, Alan. You've been a great help. No problem. Have a good night. He stood up, exiting the interrogation room. I felt my body relax, my antennae curling slowly. Why was I so creeped out? It was just an interrogation over a car crash. I had seen far, far worse. Not only that, but it had taken only five minutes. Now that he had left, I had to watch the footage of me interrogating him. Maybe there was some body language I missed. I pulled up a document on human body language, and to my surprise, it was only six pages. Six pages. The average was 17. Nevertheless, I quickly read it, and it was basic stuff. Facial expressions, posture, gestures, eye contact, and voice. After I finished reading, I leaned back in my chair and watched the footage of me interrogating Alan. Alan's facial expression hardly changed throughout the entire interrogation, only slightly changing when he paused to remember details. In contrast, despite my best efforts and training, my antennae were flailing around, and I was subconsciously shifting around. His posture was more or less normal, and while he didn't make that many gestures, one thing he kept was eye contact. While I looked down to type, Alan was still staring at me, his brown eyes boring into my kitten. There was something about his look that made me tremble, something I couldn't explain. It wasn't even intense or hostile. It was just felt off. Finally, I got to the part where I stupidly revealed there were no cameras in the region, and I noticed a change in Alan's posture. He sat up, his eyes more focused. That wasn't good. Alan was up to something. I just knew it. I sat up, heading home early. I was going to catch a criminal in the act. Alan walked home, head and heart pounding. This evening's events were very unexpected. He could still remember dragging the limp corpses out of their cars their empty, lifeless eyes staring into nothingness. With no medical supplies, there wasn't much he could do but try and stop their bleeding in vain. It probably wasn't even blood loss, Alan realized. It was most likely the impact of the crash that killed them. The officer had been nice, but it was Rika that he was worried about. Why was she so distressed? Admittedly, it was a distressing scene, but they were just four random people. He immediately felt guilty for thinking that. Of course, Rika got upset. It was a gruesome scene by anyone's standards, although Alan was used to seeing gore from video games and horror movies. 
Alan grabbed his phone and scrolled to find her number, which she had given to him on their first day working together. He felt even guiltier seeing all her texts, asking him if he wanted to go out drinking or hang out at a VR cafe, all of which he had declined. It wasn't that he didn't want to hang out with her. He was just busy. Since it was the weekend tomorrow, Alan decided that he might as well hang out with her. He quickly typed a message and sent it before heading off to eat dinner. Hey, Rika, I'm free this weekend. We could go to the VR cafe you're always talking about, that is, if you're not too busy. Alan. I took a sip of tea, and I could feel my body relaxing. I tried my hardest to forget the bodies lying still next to each other on the pavement, Alan delivering first aid before just stopping. I had broken down then, crying into my paws. Four people with hopes, dreams, passions, families, and friends all dead, all gone. I took yet another sip of tea, licking my lips nervously. I remembered how Alan had tried to comfort me and how I had pushed him away. Was I too harsh? It just seemed like the right thing to do at the moment. But of course, it wasn't. Adrenaline and fear must have clouded my sense of judgment. Feeling guilty, I was overjoyed when I received a text message from Alan. Hey, Rika, I'm free this weekend. We could go to the VR cafe you're always talking about, that is, if you're not too busy. Alan. I quickly typed back a response, fumbling with my letters. Sure. Ha ha, glad you're up to go somewhere. I think it'd be great to take our minds off, you know. I finished the last of my tea, excited and nervous for tomorrow. Alan and I have never really spent time with each other outside of work, the only exception being when we walked to the monthly work parties. I immediately began planning. A few hours at the VR cafe, then maybe lunch together? Or just VR? Or maybe we could even go drinking later in the evening? My thinking was interrupted by Alan responding to my text. Yeah, same here. Also, I apologize for leaving you to speak to the police officer. I feel like staying with you would have been the better option. I felt a weird, warm feeling rippling through my body and I shivered. I hastily texted him back. It's fine. I wasn't being myself anyways, shock and all. I was driven home by another police officer. Alan replied quickly, and after I read it, I felt even more tingly inside. That's good. I'm glad you're okay now. I couldn't stand the feeling anymore. I sent Alan one last text and turned off my phone. Yeah, I'm fine now. Anyways, I gotta go to bed. Saya tomorrow. I crawled underneath the warm cover of my ergonomic bed, wondering what tomorrow would bring. Alan read Reka's final text over and over. Why had she ended their conversation so early? There were lots of things they hadn't discussed properly. The time, if anyone else was going with them, who'd be paying, etc. No worries. Sleep was very important to a kahite, after all. Alan got into his bed and cleared his throat. Lights off, he said out loud, and his bedroom lights turned off instantly. Within minutes, he was asleep. I woke early in the morning, putting on casual clothing, black shorts and a red t-shirt. Should I dress more professionally? No, it's a VR cafe. I went into my kitchen to find something to eat, and I settled for toast with river hive jam and a ripe onate. It was a simple, filling meal, and I loaded my utensils and plates into the dishwasher before texting Alan. So, what's a good time for you? I'm thinking of meeting up at around 9.30 to 10, Alan replied within a few minutes. Yeah, sure, if that's the best time for you. Let's meet up at 9.30 then, I replied to his text message as fast as I could. All right, sounds good. See you at 9.30. See you there, Alan responded. Alan parked in front of the VR cafe. It was a tall, modern building, and he entered. Reka was sitting down at a table near the entrance, and Alan silently walked up to her. Hey, he said, and Reka jumped, turning around. Hey, Alan, she squeaked, looking surprised. Good to see you. He smiled brightly and sat down across the table from her. So, what's the plan? What are we playing? he asked, and Reka grinned. Well, in terms of a plan, I don't really have one. You like shooters? she asked, and Alan sat up. Now you're talking. Got any in mind? Rika paused to think. You know, like Storm and Siege and Dash. They were big hits, with billions of copies sold across the galaxy. Wow, Rika, I had no idea you were so modern, Alan told her, and she blushed. Well, my brother got me into games and I started playing here, but I figured it'll be more fun with others. 
Reka explained. Well, don't worry, I'm here, Alan said as he stood up, walking over to a self-checkout counter. I followed Alan closely behind, almost bumping into him as he stopped abruptly. S and S or Dash, he asked, and I answered without hesitation. Dash, definitely. I agree. It's more exciting. There's more of a thrill, you know. S and SS more tactical. But there's something about getting to fight and kill more in Dash that's really fun, Alan murmured. There was something about the way he said that that made my fur slowly rise. Alan continued speaking as he looked at the VR options. It's more chaotic, and the AI feels more realistic. Instead of just playing aggressively or defensively, you can sense their emotion. You get what I'm saying? They can act scared and run away, and you have to hunt them down. I felt my tail curling around my body with fear, and I slowly backed away from him. Anyways, what AI difficulty do you want? Easy, normal, hard, merciless, ramp up? R ramp up, I stammered. Yeah, I think it's the best difficulty, too. He turned to look at me, a big smile on his face, and my fear disappeared instantly. It was weird seeing Alan being so casual and enthusiastic about something when he usually acted mature and professional. Well, I hope you're ready for the next two hours, Alan chuckled. Wait, why'd you pay, I asked. I thought I might as well pay, he replied. You didn't need to do that, I protested. It's okay. It was only $120, Alan told me. Let me get you lunch, I said, and he raised an eyebrow. Sure, I'll take that. Alan responded before looking at his phone. I got the confirmation code. Let's go. He walked to the main floor elevator, pressing the button. I paused to think in silence. Why was I so scared of Alan? Sometimes he terrified me for no real reason. There was no reason for me to feel this way, right? Maybe I was the problem. What if I'm... Rika? Alan's voice snapped me out of my thinking, and I realized Alan was holding the elevator for me. Sorry, I was thinking. I hurried into the elevator standing next to him, and he looked at me curiously. Must be some interesting thoughts, he said, but he didn't push the issue further. We reached the third floor, and I followed Alan down a long hallway in front of an electronic door. He entered the confirmation code, and we entered the room.